Good morning, I'm Don Brennis, Professor of Anthropology at UC Santa Cruz and a member of the ACLS Board of Directors. The first part of the ACLS mission is, quote, the advancement of humanistic studies in all fields of the humanities and social sciences, end quote. We strive to do this in many ways, but one of the chief means is by awarding research fellowships through a rigorous process of peer review. The ACLS annual meeting is one of the few venues where scholars from the full range of the humanities and interpretive social sciences can share perspectives. The ACLS fellowship programs are similarly one of the very few national institutions identifying and supporting scholarly excellence across the range of these fields. Several years ago, the ACLS Board of Directors suggested we bring these two roles together by convening at each annual meeting a panel of recent fellows. And speaking from my experience, as much as I love the rest of the program, these are always the most exciting and exhilarating sessions. ACLS offers a number of distinct fellowship programs, and each of the fellows on the panel received awards from a different program. The programs are described on pages of your agenda book, but the most important point common to all of these is that the competition of, for awards is stiff, and review panels often comment that they can make double, from the committees I've been on, I would say treble, the number of awards available with no loss in quality. It's for that reason that ACLS is determined to increase the number of fellowships we annually provide, both by securing more term grants and by increasing the endowments that support our oldest, oldest program the one simply called ACLS Fellowships. That endowment has been built up over the years with donations from foundations, colleges, and universities, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the many individual donors who have responded each year to Pauline Yu's appeal for investment in the future of humanities scholarship, a future we can glimpse this morning with the help of these colleagues. You have in your agenda materials biographies of each of the fellows who will be speaking, so I will forego long inter introductions. We've asked each to speak briefly about their research and especially about how they situate their projects in relation to currents in the field and their own intellectual ambitions. And after each has spoken, then there'll be time for questions, discussions, and the kinds of conversations that these presentations always generate. So let me first introduce Maddie Burkert, who is Assistant Professor of Literature at Utah State University. Hello, uh, thank you so much for that introduction. And I wanna start off by expressing my appreciation to the ACLS and the amazing staff who plan this conference and who run this council. Uh, it's an honor to have been an ACLS fellow and to be speaking with you today. I held a dissertation completion fellowship from 2015 to 2016, and it was during the fellowship year that I was able to arrive at the central insight of my dissertation project, which has driven the revision of the project now as a monograph um, under review. And that, <laughs> that insight was the existence of a previously unrecognized theater finance nexus that was central to 17th and 18th century economic and political thought and that became a critical site for theorizations of London's rapidly changing publics during this period. What do I mean by theater finance nexus? To begin with, I should explain that my research in this project turns to the historical moment when many of today's economic structures and practices arose, uh, the so-called financial revolution in England. In the decades following William and Mary's ascent to the throne in 1688, England saw a widespread adoption of phenomena like national debts, credit-based currencies, derivative securities, boom-bust cycles. Many of these innovations were hotly debated. And I, as I have found, London's public playhouses played a central role in those conversations. Plays and entertainments engaged with financial concerns at the level of plot, characterization, and language, addressing audience members as economic subjects within complex webs of interdependence and conflict. Accordingly, in my book project, I do examine theatrical performance offerings and criticism from moments of economic instability. Importantly, though, performance was not the only way that the theater engaged with financial markets. The economics of theater itself was significantly reshaped during the period. Audiences were reconfigured by broader changes in class structures and gender roles, and the public playhouses had to change to accommodate 
their changing tastes. In order to do so, they tested out innovations from the worlds of trade and finance as they tried to survive. And the history of the people who invested in the theaters is absolutely fascinating during this period. Observers of these shifts articulated a sense of the theater as a form of mass culture that operated according to the rules of the market, increasingly speculative and dependent on public opinion. The theater and its media landscape then provided a site for debating the operations of speculative finance, the power of the rising middle classes, and the growing ability of public opinion to shape the value of commodities as well as to hold institutions accountable. At a moment when the formal discipline of political economy was in its infancy, the theatrical mediascape provided a discursive space for understanding complex economic systems. And importantly, it was one that stressed affect, contingency, and the potential irrationality of markets rather than quantification and reason. In recovering this theater finance nexus, my project challenges received notions of the primacy of the coffee house as the locus of public debate in 18th century England and strives to reorient both literary and economic history toward the theatrical public. So I thought one of the best ways to use my time would be to just give you an example of how this theater finance nexus looked and how it worked. To do that, I turn now to the South Sea bubble of 1720. The South Sea bubble was arguably one of the first modern stock market crashes. And its central novelty as far as 18th century observers were concerned was that it involved making money out of money. Cut off from the Atlantic slave trade by hostilities between England and Spain, the South Sea directors developed a complex scheme to grow the company's value by buying up existing government debt and swapping it for equity in the company. And there are some uh, really compelling histories out now about how the role of the slave trade in all of this has been sort of grossly underrepresented. Um, the scheme generated massive speculative interest that far exceeded any underlying value it might have had. And as you can see, shares in the company rocketed to 10 times their face value at midsummer before plummeting in the fall. The crash is estimated to have affected about 30,000 people and corporations, and it loomed large in the English imagination for decades, influencing the likes of David Hume and Adam Smith. The theater was a short-lived periodical published for four months at the beginning of 1720, just before the summer of the bubble. The author Richard Steele was a well-known journalist, playwright, theater manager, and member of parliament. Beginning in February 1720, his periodical becomes preoccupied with exposing the South Sea scheme as a fraud. And the fact that his periodical called the theater obsessed with the South Sea scheme is part of the indication of this nexus I'm talking about. And this is from the 1791 edition, so this is a later uh, edition, but you can see that the issue number 27 consists entirely of a series of detailed calculations of the South Sea Company's underlying stock value under a variety of circumstances, as well as projections of the return on investment expected on a single share at the various proposed interest rates. And just imagine buying a news sheet called the theater, and it's this. These uh, meticulous calculations demonstrate that investment in the South Sea Company will provide modest, if any, benefits to individual investors unless the stock price can be forced well above a realistic value, in which case a handful of early investors may benefit and all others suffer. It was a classic Ponzi scheme. The stark rows of sums are presented as self-evident proof of the scheme's fraudulence, and the issue concludes, for the truth of all these calculations, I appeal to every Prentice boy. At the same time, in the same periodical, Steele was also busy unmasking another speculative venture, the Royal Academy of Music, a joint stock company incorporated in 1719 to finance an opera house in London. It was seen as a pet project of the crown and nobility, raising most of its capital from courtiers and government officials, and from the king. Never, nonetheless, the Royal Academy took its structure from the world of finance rather than that of patronage. It had a board of 20 directors elected from among subscribers, and its investment and governance mechanisms were quite similar to those of other joint stock ventures like the South Sea Company. Many of Steele's critiques of the Royal Academy are grounded in conventional thought about the opera, that it appealed to sensual pleasure alone, that it was irrational and immoral, an invasion of continental sensibilities and vices that had no place in English culture. The theater does make these points, but it also builds a larger case that links the opera company to the fraudulent South Sea scheme. Steele casts the Royal Academy as a predatory attempt by elites to exploit the desires and pleasures of the masses, leading them to support financially an institution that abuses and corrupts them. Issue 18 of the theater, which was published on March 1st, offers Steele's most sustained critique of the predatory aesthetics and economics of the opera. His distaste for operatic music hinges on the conventional op opposition between sound and sense, where sound represents the mindless sensory pleasures of musical entertainment and sense the potential for intellectual and ethical engagement. 
The narrator implies that London publics shy away from entertainments that require mental effort. He offers an example of the kind of song that he says is approved of by, quote, the present refiners of our taste in music and poetry. And it is a nonsense song, entirely devoid of meaning. So, notwithstanding, heretofore, straightforward, by and by, now, everlastingly, therefore, too low and ache too high. <laughs> then, for almost, and also, why, not thus, when less so near? Oh, for hereafter, quite so nigh, but greatly ever here. As the narrator observes, this piece is sure to be met with uh, applause. He says, quote, for it gives no manner of disturbance to the head, <laughs> but merely serves to be added to sounds proper for the syllables. In other words, the current taste is for verses designed primarily as accompaniments to music, rather than as vehicles for meaning. Songs need only have stresses and rhymes in the right place to be considered art. This is his point. He paints the nonsense song as symptomatic of a culture where people try to make a profit without producing real value. Quote, if these high designs were carried on, nonsensical as they are, without prospect of gain, there would still be something liberal in them. But they have received a tincture of all the sense that seems to remain among us, the sense of profit. There is a stock laid in to impose upon the stupidity of the admirers, and it is expected there will be a nightly succession of bubbles in numbers large enough who will part with their cash as well as their understanding to support a mechanic and mean profit raised by gentlemen of honor and quality upon ingenious arts arbitrary dealings with performers of both sexes to bring them to their prizes, and helping their no sense or nonsense of reason with their no sense or nonsense of conscience are the methods by which this lamentable community of virtuosos seems to aim at an establishment. The, pi the passage is obviously rife with the language of finance, stock, profit, gain, cash, prizes, bubbles. This language suggests the extent to which, as Steele laments, the culture of sense and manners has been replaced by one obsessed with money. Specifically, uh, profit is made from the stupidity of bubbles, and no one ever said that Richard Steele wasn't himself an elitist. Um, that is gullible individuals who've been tricked into foolhardy investments. Opera goers voluntarily relinquish sense in favor of entertainments devoid of real value, like a worthless stock that represents no underlying capital. Naive spectators pay real money for the false value produced by the opera company, parting with cash and understanding in the same move. Worse, in Steele's view, the fraud is perpetrated by gentlemen of honor and quality, that is, the virtuosos of the Royal Academy, upon the masses. Steele then links financial and cultural predation through, its concern, through his concern with the falsified value of opera tickets, implicitly linked to valueless stocks. But the connection is made more explicit at the end of the issue, in a notice that appears directly above the publisher's advertisements. So um, advertisements under the word advertisements were placed by the publisher. Um, but just above that, Yesterday, South Sea was 174, Opera Company 83 and a half, no transfer. It's clearly meant to be the Royal Academy, but the stock price is facetious. The Academy shares were not publicly traded, nor were its share prices printed in periodicals. The phrase no transfer was an actual qualifier in many stock listings at the time, used to indicate whether shares in one company could be exchanged for shares in another and at what rate. In this case, the phrase is technically correct. You could not pay for stock in the South Sea Company using Royal Academy shares or vice versa. But this fact would have been self-evident to readers. And the gratuitousness of the phrase actually draws attention to the very possibility it negates, reinforcing the conceptual transfer Steele has encouraged throughout the issue. And I'll just mention that the opera company becomes a running gag in the theater. Um, in issue 20, an openly satirical announcement, again appearing shortly before the publisher's advertisement, says, at the rehearsal on Friday last, Signor Nihilini Beneditti rose half a note above his pitch formerly known, opera stock from 80 and 83 and a half when he began at 90 when he ended. <laughs> the advertisement's a barely veiled reference to a well-known castrato, singer Nicolini, here transformed into Nihilini, returning to the motif of no sense or nonsense, representing entertainment evacuated of its intellectual content. Senior nothing produces no sense, yet he still raises the opera stock's value above uh, its former value as he raises his pitch. The advertisement mocks the irrationality of stock price movements and their tenuous relationship to actual assets, critiquing an economy of false value uh, to which the public willingly contributes by consuming mindless entertainment and buying into the market's empty promises. As this example has begun to suggest, locating the theater finance nexus requires attending not only to dramatic works, but also to the broader media landscape of the theater. Topical prologues and epilogues, advertisements for performances and for printed plays, periodicals that evocatively intertwine financial and entertainment news, and records of performance from sources like playbills and diaries. Documents such as these have 
historically been used largely to register the bare facts of theater history. But my project recognizes the sophisticated cultural work they do as they engage with economic developments. This approach reflects what I see as a growing methodological commitment in early modern theater studies to take seriously those materials previously considered ancillary to the drama and to articulate more sharply the interplays of print and performance cultures in the period. At the same time, my interest in the media landscape of long 18th century Britain and the mediated nature of our access to theater of the period animates another project, one that has grown out of and alongside my first book project. In my initial application to the ACLS, I proposed a dissertation that was also a digital humanities project, one that would build on my initial attempts to develop a database of performance records and documents from the period. It was during the fellowship year that I came to recognize the potential of that database to be a separate project, one that has since been funded by the NEH's Office of Digital Humanities. I'm currently leading a team of developers at Utah State University in collaboration with advisors at Harvard, the University of Pennsylvania, MIT, the University of Wisconsin, Texas A&M, and the New York Public Library to develop a database of the records found in the 8,000 page reference book, The London Stage 1660 to 1800. And as I discovered in the later stages of my doctoral work, such a database had already been undertaken once before in the 1970s. The London Stage Information Bank, as it was then called, was developed from 1970 to 1978 under the direction of Professor Ben R. Schneider, Jr. at Lawrence University in Appleton, Wisconsin. It was developed with support from the NEH, the Mellon Foundation, and yes, the ACLS. Today, however, many of the project's accomplishments have been lost or corrupted, and despite an ongoing need for this resource, few theater researchers know that it ever existed. And, and why is that? Um, I don't have time to go into it now, but I published an essay in last year in Digital Humanities Quarterly presenting this work as a cautionary tale shedding light on issues of access, preservation, and institutional memory that are the focus of much debate in digital humanities today. Um, so these are just some amazing archival images of um, students entering and editing the data. This is the computer they time-shared uh, with the Institute of Paper Chemistry. <laughs> Travels in Computerland is an amazing memoir. If you can get a copy, I would suggest reading it. Um, so thank you to the Lawrence Archives for letting me use those. So our website uh, is planning to layer the recovered data and code from the original information bank with a new database reflecting current approaches to theater history and performance studies. Theirs was not a relational database, right? It had to be a flat file database. We're working on a relational model. In this multifaceted research environment, users will be able to view and compare the pages of the reference book with the data produced in the 1970s, newly parsed flat file data, and structured XML and JSON. So um, this is just sort of a wireframe, not the actual website, but you'll be able to look at the original reference book entry and then also the incredibly corrupted data found uh, in the archives and then so our new version. So you'll be able to view these things side by side um, in a kind of rotating gallery under the main um, display image. If you can kind of imagine a carousel like on Amazon, um, you will be able to kind of view a gallery of the ways this data has looked over time. The database will allow scholars to perform complex and targeted queries, such as comparing the offerings of anti-treason plays like Tamerlan and Macbeth at rival theaters on and around Guy Fawkes Day each year, or tracing the competition between star actors playing the same part at different playhouses within a few days of each other. A user comfortable with more advanced computational methods might download the full data set and import it into a network visualization tool like Gephi, where they could perform exploratory analyses of the social networks among performers, playhouses, and other actants on the London theater scene. And it's our hope that having access to this database will be as important for theater scholars as access to EBO and ECHO has been um, for textual scholars. Furthermore, we're designing this research environment so that it encourages scholars not only to explore the new kinds of access afforded to early modern culture through digitization and quantification, but to grapple with the geneses, affordances, and potential biases of the data sets and tools at hand. As the digital becomes an increasingly mainstream part of the work we do as scholars, I believe we have a responsibility to remain attentive to the materiality of the digital resources with which we work, to their histories, and to the ways they shape our access to and perception of the past. In other words, I believe that digital humanities work must remain deeply motivated by um, humanistic traditions and orientations, maintaining the humanities awareness of the mediated, situated, contingent, and ambiguous nature of all knowledge, uh, even as these new methods open up and reshape academic disciplines. Thank you.
Thanks very much. Our next speaker is Kito Swan, who is professor of African diaspora studies at African diaspora history, excuse me, at Howard University. Thank you, Don. I would like to first thank the ACLS staff and administrators for your support. This generous Frederick Burkhoff Fellowship has been transformative for my work. I've truly enjoyed my year at Harvard's Reactive Institute of Advanced Study. Um, most of the documents you see, or the, the primary documents you see, you're going to see in my presentation, we gathered from archives across Australia, the United States, Papua New Guinea, Fiji, Wanawatu, Kenya, London, and also Bermuda. Uh, this fellowship has allowed me to really have the time to not only conduct research, but also investigate my own archive, which is a tremendous opportunity that many of scholars we don't always, often have. Melanesia's way is centered on black internationalism in Oceania. Uh, this is perhaps the first intervention in my work in terms of African diaspora history, which typically looks at black internationalism as a phenomenon of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, but my work is trying to further demonstrate connections between the black world across the Indian and Pacific Oceans as well. Oceania uh, usually refers to the South Pacific. I am much interested in Melanesia, which refers to Papua New Guinea, Wanawatu, Fiji, New Caledonia, and places like the Solomon Islands. But today I'm gonna, send, I'm gonna focus much more on Papua New Guinea. I'm following the work of Merce Tate in many ways, who was a professor of history at Howard University, who wrote extensively about Oceania and decolonization in the era of post-World War II. This is also an extension of my own work on black power. Uh, my first book, Black Power in Bermuda, sought to demonstrate that black power was a global phenomenon that extended beyond the contours of the United States. So the, my topic today is gonna look at black power in Oceania, specifically in Papua New Guinea. When we think of black power, uh, we should see it as a global phenomenon. This is a photograph of Bermuda's Black Parade Cadre which the CIA interestingly labeled Che Guevara at his most militant in 1972. That's up for some debate. Uh, this is Olive Morris, uh, Black Panther, London's Black Panther Party. This is a document from the Black Panther Party of Australia. New Zealand also had this version of the Polynesian Panthers, which also, when we think of Black Power globally, usually we follow the, the threads of the Black Panther Party. I'm also interested in other black power formations that were not based on the Black Panther model, like the New Guinea Black Power Group, which was formed in 1970 at the University of Papua New Guinea. Uh, this photograph is of the university in 1971. It became a major hub for discourses on Melanesian nationalism. This is critical because while in 1970, Papua New Guinea is, at least if you believe the covers of Time and Life magazine, still a land before time, for many black movements in Oceania, Papua New Guinea was a vision of black modernity, a vision of the future, a vision of the way uh, for black countries or black freedom struggles as in Australia. Leo Hennett was one of the founders of the New Guinea Black Power Group. He states that the group was founded during one of many late night anti-colonialist hate sessions. Uh, somewhat tongue in cheek, he discusses how New Guinea Black Power was a Fanon-inspired, as in France Fanon, African negritude movement, which is striking because we don't, it's not so surprising to see Fanon, negritude, and African, an African movement uh, in one sentence, but to see groups in Papua New Guinea or Oceania engaging these ideas may be surprising to some. Hannon also stated that while the New Guinea Black Power Group had been influenced by the US-based movement and African negritude, they were not enslaved to these ideas. In other words, black power in Papua New Guinea was relative to its own local conditions. It was as relevant to New Guinea as the Betunat. If you've had the chance or the great opportunity to travel to Oceania, you may have tried a Betunat. Uh, it's very strong, but it's been there for so long that the statement to me is 
very much a political statement, a cultural statement that just as we chewed or not, and we chewed the not for thousands of years, black power makes sense because we are black people. At least this is what Hannett argued. Why black power? Because the philosophy, the, the phrase black power gave the philosophy of self-determination as ginger, pepper, and lime stuff. These were three items that was usually eaten with, and still eaten with, the Beto not. But beyond phenotype, black power in Papua New Guinea was also about nation building and decolonization. What were some of the key issues that the New Guinea black power group sought to address? One was decolonization from Australia. Uh, as Papua New Guinea moved to independence in the mid-1970s, it spurned the rise of a number of movements for sovereignty, including that of Josephine Abajai, Papua Besana. A number of these groups influenced the Black Power Group. They also were very concerned with the exploitation of Papua New Guinea's mineral resources. As in a major incident that took place in 1969, where a transnational mining company in a place called Bougainville forcibly removed um, communities from the land. In this, in this very iconic and visible moment, 25 women were attacked by the police who attacked the villages with tear gas and batons. And this becomes a really important um, discussion for the Black Power Group. They also were concerned with Indonesian imperialism in West Papua. And one of the lessons that we get um, from this moment is that for the Black Power Group, imperialism is not only does not only show up in European clothing. Uh, Indonesia colonized their Western neighbors, West Papua, and this was really striking. This photograph, of this, this newspaper rather, is from the Pittsburgh Courier in 1960, which Pittsburgh Courier being a very popular African-American newspaper, where West Papuans sought help from the Negro brothers and sisters. They define themselves as being African, called on organizations like the NAACP for support, the United Nations. This letter is from Roy Wilkins, who was director of NAACP, who goes to the United Nations and discussed how maybe black Americans knew little of the ethnic cousins in West New Guinea. And they sought support at the highest levels of the international world. Now, this is important for me because in many ways, this discussion on black consciousness and black international oceania may seem like a novel idea. Uh, in, in 2018, but if we just take a few steps back, we see this has been part of a, a much broader and long-standing discourse between the African diaspora across the Atlantic, Indian, and Pacific Ocean worlds. And on that note, the Black Power Group engaged the ideas of African liberation struggles as well. They read James Baldwin, Kwame Nkrumah, Negritus Prezans African, Wilesa Yinka, Achebe, Senghor, Malcolm, Martin. All these were regular regular essays and discourses and conversations that they engaged through seminars, through demonstrations. Kwame Ture's Black Power was vividly read across campus. What did they do with these ideas? Well, one, they produced this tremendous canon of Melanesian thought and ideas through poetry, literature, plays, visual arts, song, dance, and in many ways, they transformed Melanesia from being once a colonial imposition to a really radical idea, a radical framework for black transnationalism in Oceania. One that connected itself with the broader black world, but also connected itself with indigeneity within the region. This photograph is of Noah Brash and the Papua New Guinea National Theater Company, a really a significant company. Um, Papua New Guinea also sent delegates like Nora to the Festival of African Arts and Culture, also known as FASTAC, in Nigeria in 1977. The founder of the, new, the, the theater group was Arthur Joe Nabare, who in 1971 studied popular theater across Nigeria, Japan, the United States, and in Ghana. In Nigeria, he met with playwrights like Obi Ekbuna, Ghana, Fua Sutherland, United States, Barbara Antier, he returns to Papua New Guinea, forms his own company. People like John Kazapalova, one of his peers in the New Guinea Black Power Group, was a self-described black nationalist. Uh, he wrote a really powerful poem titled Reluctant Flames, which he called for New Guinea nationalists to take fuel from their brother struggles, including the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa and the United States. What did this mean for Oceania? 
Well, the New Guinea Black Power Group, and by extension, the University of Papua New Guinea, became this beacon of Melanesian nationalism that attracted activists, scholars, and writers from across the region uh, who were curious to see what was Papua New Guinea producing and how could they learn from this immediate struggle. Once again, this is critical because at the same moment, New Guinea is being portrayed in the Western media as a land of savages and cannibals and untouched peoples, which is in contrast to this narrative. So for example, Vanessa Griffin and Claire Slater, two really critical activists from Fiji, travel to Papua New Guinea. They study creative arts, they get involved in popular theater. The impact in Oceania in the 1970s, uh, we can't speak of it enough. They organized the Pacific Women's Conference in 1975. They traveled to Mexico for International Women's Conference. They were key players in the anti-nuclear testing movement. They produced magazines like Povai, which was this transnational newspaper of political struggles across Polynesia, Melanesia. They also worked closely with one of the subjects from my first book and now current project, Paolo Kamarkafego, who was an ecological engineer from Bermuda who traveled the world. Uh, he was also very much involved in the Sixth Pan African Congress. He travels to Papua New Guinea in the 1970s. He works for the newly independent government in its Office of Village Development, where he creates this manual, How to Build a Water Tank with Bamboo and Cement, while in Papua New Guinea. The book was designed by Vanessa Griffin. He spent a number of years in Papua New Guinea, and he was just one of many individuals who went to Papua New Guinea to get involved in this new project of building a new black state in various areas, from economics to science, and appropriate technology, and also the arts. Bobby Sykes is another one of these individuals. Bobby Sykes is a key black power activist from Australia. Her father was an African-American GI. To the Australian media, she was Australia's version of Angela Davis. Uh, she wouldn't have denied that parallel as well. She was an extremely incredible figure. She traveled all across Oceania. She spent time in the United States as well. Uh, and she found herself in Jamaica during the Sixth Pan-African Congress. She also obtained a PhD from Harvard University, and she's considered to be the first Aboriginal uh, person to do that. And so in my time at the Radcliffe, I've had the pleasure of looking at some of the documents that she left behind. Um, as stated, the ACLS has given me a wonderful opportunity to explore the papers of artists like Willis Yinka, who references the, the South Pacific and the likes. Uh, Melanesia's way. Thank you. Thanks very much, Keto. And our final speaker is Ryan Thumb, who is Associate Professor of History at Loyola University, New Orleans. Good afternoon. Um, it's a real joy and an honor to be here. The ACLS Fellowship has allowed me to pursue my uh, project at a much bigger scale than I had originally imagined, and so I'm, I'm deeply grateful to everyone involved in the organization. I want to do three things with my time. First, I, I want to introduce the book project that I'm undertaking with the support of the ACLS Fellowship, as well as the Residential Fellowship at the National Humanities Center. Um, and then, uh, second, I'll talk a little bit about another uh, project, a digitization project that has, has grown out of this. And then if I have some time left, I'll make a couple of um, methodological remarks in honor of the, the, the title of this panel. Um, <clears throat> the way I think to best introduce my book project, which is a, a history of Islamic China over the last 300 years, is through two texts. Uh, the first you see here is a uh, uh, a product of, it's, an, it's a re-edition of an older text uh, uh, brought to print by an editor named Ma Lianyuan. And it was printed in uh, southern China in the 19th century 
And it's very much typical of its time and place. So for example, this is a woodblock text, which is the preferred way of producing books in China from the 8th or 9th century all the way down to the 20th century. It's a technology that's particularly well suited to producing, uh, reproducing the Chinese uh, writing system economically. It's also, in terms of genre, a very typical product of 19th century China. This is a three-character classic. It's, a, it's a, a kind of a verse genre that's made to be easily memori memorizable. Um, that has been popular for many centuries in China for uh, uh, teaching children Confucian, the ethics of the Confucian, uh, Confucian classics. Here it's been repurposed to teach children uh, the uh, cosmology and, and ethics of Islam as it was understood in Yunnan in the 19th century. The second text I want to introduce you to is uh, this one by a man named Muhammad Nur al-Haq, bin Asaid Luqman, which was published in northern India in 1902-1903. Uh, this, too, is typical of, of its time and place. It is a lithograph, which was the, uh, a very popular technology in 19th century India, particularly for uh, Muslims publishing in Urdu, Arabic, and Persian, because it can very cheaply and accurately reproduce the sacred um, calligraphic forms of the Arabic alphabet, something that movable type couldn't do and which wasn't really uh, uh, exceeded until photolithography came along. Um, it's also typical of a northern Indian text in its genre. This is a commentary on a commentary on a Central Asian anthology of Islamic legal opinions. These, uh, these kinds of super commentaries on interpretive texts were extremely popular in northern India uh, at this time. And one of my side projects is to, to figure out exactly why a commentary on a commentary on an anthology is extremely interesting and not extremely boring, um, <laughs> because it was not boring to the people who, who, who made these texts. Anyway, the point I want to make about these two texts is that Ma Lianyuan and Muhammad Nur al-Haq are actually the same person. Um, Ma Lianyuan, like, like most of his contemporary uh, Muslims in Yunnan, was educated in Persian and in Arabic. And this equipped him very well when, after a uh, pilgrimage to Mecca, he decided to settle down in India. And it made it quite easy for him to integrate into the local scholarly community. Now, if we are surprised that Muhammad Nur al-Haq and Ma Lianyuan are the same person, I would argue that it's because for even the most sophisticated among us, the notions of China and of Islam that, that we rely on are in the end rooted in an essentialism, in some idea of a trans-historic core reality to these two, uh, to these two concepts that's immediately recognizable, and that makes it almost impossible for us to imagine the, the text you're looking at as a part of Islamic history, and equally impossible to imagine this text as a Chinese text. So one of the goals of my book, which is a kind of a revisionist um, history of, of Islamic China, is to naturalize this kind of phenomenon, to make it completely unsurprising, to make it quotid quotidian, boring, um, maybe just kind of exactly what you'd expect out of China. Um, and, and this has required some, uh, a bit of a divergence from the way the history of Islam in China has been pursued in terms of what kinds of sources I'm using. For reasons I won't get into here, the um, vast majority of scholarship on Islamic China has been based on sources in the Chinese language. There is some fantastic work on the Persian and Arabic sources, but it has not really um, uh, made its way into the more synthetic and, and long durée studies of the more than 1,000 year history of Muslims in China. Um, this is remarkable because for many periods in Chinese history, the uh, the Persian and the Arabic and also the Turkic documents represent the majority of sources produced by 
uh, Chinese Muslims. So having them, having them omitted creates a, a very, in my opinion, a very distorted picture of the role of, of Islam in, in China. Um, I hope through, through reincorporating them, I can, I can turn this thing that I've showed you here into so something more, more normal. It also turns up some, some interesting, uh, more um, practical on the ground changes to how we see the history of China. For example, any world history textbook will, will tell you that India had a strong influence um, on Chinese culture through the transmission of Buddhism, but then we'll sort of leave you hanging after the 11th century to assume that when Buddhism faded in India, India ceased to have much importance in China. The Persian and Arabic documents, which are so numerous in, um, in, in China, show instead that Muslim networks of Muslims, Chinese or Indian or whatever you want to call them, um, were continuously involved in bringing in South Asian ideas into China. Those are invisible because we're not looking at the right sources and because Islam is seen as something foreign and exceptional uh, in China in a way that Buddhism is not. All right, I'll leave the, I'll leave the book project behind for, for, for now and talk about uh, how this has developed in, into a digitization and preservation uh, project which uh, I will be pursuing over the next three years with a uh, fellowship from the University of Nottingham. Um, and again, these two texts will be useful for, for introducing this. There's another thing that these two texts have in common, and that is, as far as I can tell, neither of them is available in any publicly accessible archive anywhere in the world. So where, where did I get them then? The, um, the Chinese language text came from, from this home, the home of a hoarder and antique dealer in a, a village in Yunnan. And the Arabic text, there's the outside of his house, this is his hoard of uh, mortars, as in mortar and pestle. Um, and the Arabic language text printed in India uh, came from this mosque, which had recently received a donation of a, of a small family uh, library also in Yunnan. What this points up is a larger phenomenon that you find in many parts of Asia, including uh, India and, and Burma, which is that archives tend to be dominated very much by the state and state funding to an extent that exceeds, for example, the United States. And th these, these states that are doing the funding tend to be nationalist states for whom Muslim minorities don't fit well with the national narrative. And so these documents either get preserved but not cataloged or, or opened up, or they get not, not preserved at all. So um, what I aim to do with my uh, digitization process, which is very much in its inf infancy, and I'm very um, jealous of Maddie's um, uh, <laughs> already visible work on the digital end of it, is to make, uh, to empower communities to preserve their own documents and to make it easy for them and for historians who, who work in these kinds of informal archives of antique dealers, family, family collections, mosque libraries, tomb libraries, to make it easy for them to take images of these documents and to upload them to a central repository that makes them widely available. Um, this is, I think, actually something of an emergency situation. There are places where it's already too late to do this. Um, for example, in uh, Xinjiang, uh, China's colonial po possession in Central Asia, which was the subject of my, my first book, um, there are massive operations of, of destruction of documents and books that uh, began uh, several years ago. Of course, it's a reemergence of an older trend, actually, in China. But um, here's an image from, a, from a, a few years ago. As we know, efforts to disappear people from history are occasionally prelude to eff efforts to disappear them from the present. And indeed, over the last year, there has been a massive disappearance project underway in, in Xinjiang it's not clear how permanent uh, the, the, the disappearances are, but about 5 to 10% of the 10 million 
strong Uyghur uh, minority, about 5 to 10 percent of that population has, has been disappeared into so-called re-education camps over, uh, over the last year. So one of my hopes is that by making the uh, often hidden histories of Muslim minorities uh, throughout, throughout Asia more visible and more accessible to historians who, who have difficulty accessing them because they're not in the state archives, to make, to make those things more accessible and more widely written about so that people like the Uyghurs have more of a home in the national projects that drive the politics of, of most of the world today. Um, it looks like I do have some time for a couple of uh, methodological uh, points. I guess uh, the um, you know the, the title of this panel talks about uh, I think emergent themes and and methodologies. I, I'm going to advocate for a, a re-emergent methodology, which is an an ethnographic historical practice. You know, as historians are often trained with the assumption that when you go out to do your dissertation, where do you head first? You head to the archive. And what is the archive? Normally, it's one of these enormous public inst institutions. Historians talk about the archive much in the same way anthropologists talk about the field. Obviously, this is Im important work, but it's often done to the exclusion of another kind of archival practice, which is to begin in the communities that we study, where there are often professionals, sometimes uh, scoffed at, like antique dealers and hoarders, um, who have a great interest in their own, uh, their own textual past. And there are a lot of these uh, historical documents which are still in use as sacred texts uh, sacred text today. So uh, I said that this is a reemergence because before these large archives became the norm, People were doing this kind of ethnographically driven archival work anyway. If you look at what the uh, sort of imperialist adventurer Europeans were doing who came to China in the 19th and early 20th century, they did very much the same thing. They went to mosques, they went to antiquarians, and they, and they started from, from, uh, from the, ground, the ground up. So um, I guess I'll end with a call uh, for that kind of ethnographically uh, centered uh, archival project which helps us to um, capture what some of what is rendered invisible by the nationalist background of, of state-driven archives. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ryan, and thanks to all three of our speakers. Um, questions? Yes, please. Excuse me while I point. I truly enjoyed, appreciated the stimulation of my imagination, and definitely appreciated the serious academic work that the three of you are doing. So first, I thank you very kindly. I have three questions. I'm going to put them on the table, and they can be answered however, OK, rather than going on. And did you notice I only had a short preface? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. OK. My first question would be to the gentleman who spoke last, and that question would be, well, it's to you, but it's really to the total of the council. You mentioned ethnographic archives, and my spirit just soared. My work is in Cuba, and the ethnographic archives are there, but we don't get to go very much. One or two of us who knows, in five years, 10 years, maybe five of us can go. So my question is, have you any thoughts on that? Second question. Um, I wonder, is there a historical contribution to Melanesia from the African diaspora? That is to say, a factual historical one. In other words, did the African displacement, the diaspora, the actual historical four year, four century event touch Melanesia? I know some answers, but I don't know all. And then the third, last question, when you spoke of anti-apartheid South Africa, US, did you actually mean that Melanesia saw the United States as an apartheid place that needed to have it removed? I'd like to respond first, right? Sure. Um, Yes, so I, I, I really appreciate this question of who gets to go and, and, and when. Um, and 
I've already seen in, in my short career, many places which were open are no longer open. Or uh, for example, um, if I were to go back to the sites of my research for my first book, merely speaking to people would, would likely send them to the re-education camps. Um, so this to me makes it even more crucial that w when people like me are doing the research that involves, say, photographing a manuscript um, at a tomb shrine, that I don't just keep it on my own computer, which is at risk of, of loss, um, or degeneration, but that I, that I have some easy way to upload it to some central repository. But even more than that, wouldn't it be great if the, the people who are, are, are the inheritors of this history had the interest and the knowledge and the access to that kind of preservation, uh, preservation activity, so that even if, only a, a, if, even if we're in a period where only a, a few people can go to Cuba, uh, Cubans themselves might have some access. Now, I understand in Cuba, as in Xinjiang, um, that access to the internet is, is limited and that's a problem, but uh, I don't think that should stop us from trying to build a, a system that can eventually lead to that kind of opportunity. Uh, thank you for the, the, the question. I think the most simple way, and it's not simple, uh, but for this format, in terms of the reference to the Atlantic um, slave trade and its connections with Oceania, there's a phenomenon that emerges in the mid, early to late 19th century that's typically defined as blackbirding, where Melanesian communities, usually from Papua New Guinea and Wanawatu, were taken to Australia uh, and places like Fiji to work on sugar and cotton plantations. A number of the instigators of this trade were former Southern Confederates who had lost the economic prowess um, during the Civil War. And so they transferred a number of the cotton and also sugar operations to Oceania. So there's a ton of Confederate finance um, in this trade. Uh, this also impacted communities that were racialized and colonized as being Polynesian. So some communities were taken from places like Fiji, uh, well, not just Fiji, but also Tahiti, to Peru uh, and the Andes um, in the aftermath of the abolition of, of slavery uh, in, in South America. So there are these definite overlaps. The reference, the, the, the name Black Burden also is a reference to how these communities were colonized as being black. But these connections, some a fleeting and some are more sustained encounters. So for example, one of Australia's first bush rangers, who bush rangers used to refer to uh, convicts who had escaped um, from Australia's convict labor system and headed to the bush, so to speak. One of the, the earlier persons, um, this is now 18th century, his name was Black Caesar. And Black Caesar, Caesar was either from Madagascar or Barbados, um, but he escapes in Australia and he has a few interesting run-ins with a number of different uh, Aboriginal leaders. Um, one whose name was Pumawe, who today would be referred to, if he was in America, he'd be referred to a Maroon. Uh, but in Australia, he's you know, an indigenous person, so it's his, his, his own his own land, so to speak. Uh, that's a, one small example of a fleeting encounter, but there's sustained connections, um, the African-American sailors that are constantly a part of this black burden phenomenon that end up on ships. Some of the ships were slaving ships that were used in the Atlantic slave trade. Um, so I think the phenomenon of a black burden, you know, there's some scholarship on that. And it's, a, it's a part of my work as well, but I think as, as we move forward, we'll probably see much more. Um, one of the, the better books on the black burden was written by Gerald Horn. Uh, the book's called the, the White Pacific, which I would possibly well, actually refer you to, to look at if you haven't um, done so already. Did you want to address the apartheid? Oh, Question. my apologies. Uh, I was definitely referring to apartheid as in South Africa, but 
Melanesian activists did make these parallels between, so for example, well, well, Aboriginal activists refer to the system of segregation in Australia as being apartheid, uh, which is not atypical for the moment. Um, we, we saw the African Americans sometimes referring to conditions in the United States as apartheid. We see it in the Caribbean, we also see it referred to in places like Palestine. So the, the, I was using it in a specific context, but it's definitely being used um, by these activists much more broader to connect with the larger black world. Other questions? Yes, Monica. Thanks. Um, this is my first ACLS meeting, and this panel has turned me into a believer, and in, <laughs> and in particular in the power of interdisciplinarity. So the, the question I have is inspired by, by Dr. Swan's work, but I think it's, it has resonances across all, all three of you, and it's about the circulation of, of knowledge. So I was struck by, um, by the comment that um, people are taking up the work of, uh, work that pub was published originally, minimally at least, uh, both in English and in French. So Fanon's work, for example, or Sangal's work. And that made me start thinking about how these kinds of bodies get constituted and get circulated transnationally. So, um, do they go, do, is it through translation? Uh, is it through multilingual individuals? What happens to the indigenous languages in, um, in these circulations? Is there something here about the role of English that we need to think about and the hegemonies that that might, um, might uh, entail? So I'm just curious to know uh, about you know, those kinds of ways in which the language in which uh, knowledge is produced, how that affects what can circulate and what can't. Uh, thank you for the question. I think it's a really important one. Wanawatu is a really fascinating country. It's one of my favorite countries in, in Oceania. Wanawatu was colonized simultaneously by the French and the British. So Wanawatu up to the independence movement, or independence in 1980, had four separate systems of law. They had a set of British laws for British citizens, French laws for French citizens, a native court, and also a joint court that was administered by a Spanish and Dutch judge, which just for a little flavor, let's just change it up a little bit. So the political term was a condominium, but colloquially, one of what they referred to as, as a pandemonium, because you know there was this colloquial jokes where if a French citizen saw a, pol a British police officer, they will continue to speed because they know the French officer doesn't legally cannot stop them. Uh, what that meant is that you have colonized peoples who go to separate French and English schools, and French and English is being spoken within the same country. Uh, so that opens up these avenues for transnational readership of literature. Places like New Caledonia, which is, remains colonized by the French, they were very much closely uh, connected with the Algerian Revolution, so to speak, Negritude. Usually the colonized end up in the metropoles of the colonizers. So folks in New Caledonia end up in Paris. Uh, folks in Wanawatu maybe end up in Britain, but also Paris, because they're colonized by the British and the French. Uh, Papua New Guinea is experimenting with bridging these gaps of these different colonial worlds. So I mentioned Indonesia. Uh, Dutch is also another language that finds its way in Indonesia, that finds its way in some of these discourses uh, on black internationalism. But you're absolutely correct as well in terms of the indigenous languages themselves and the Creole languages that are produced. So Wanawatu, once again, is so fascinating because Wanawatu's constitution had declarations, the government decrees are often be in French and English, and also Bislama, which is the indigenous Creole. And there was an intentionality of trying to address the, the, the multilingual dynamics of the nation, also the indigenous languages. Um, Papua New Guinea, I think, did a relatively, a really good job in producing literature that was not just in English. Uh, students who studied there, in, at least in the arts programs, went back into the communities to document 
traditional songs, traditional languages, and poetry, and, and theater that these other islands tried to implement. Uh, but there was a great diversity and success of some of these projects as well. But there was very much intentionality to address the concern of, of language that I think is still, still on the table um, for contemporary movements in Oceania. Thanks. Other question? I have a question for Professor Thumb. Uh, you are uh, research regarding the Islamic in China is extremely, extremely uh, timely important. Also for the fact that ethnic conflicts uh, are increasingly uh, now dangerous now, and Chinese authority uh, consider this as one of their priority in national uh, security issue. So where you go to the field or the site to visit those private entities to collect material, have you encountered this uh, security issues? How do you deal with it? And uh, if your research project is only in the middle of it, how would you continue to do that? Because your research uh, and also your attention, the attention you received and the price you received absolutely will call the authorities' attention, unwanted attention on you. So how do you deal with it? And uh, another question is ultimately your outcome, research outcome or your book, uh, if your findings are not in tune with the authorities, Chinese authorities' wish, um, will you moderate or will you compromise your discourse, your rhetoric, your way of phrasing your uh, findings, and which I personally worried because I saw a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of uh, scholars due to China's pressure, they started to say things, insincere things. They start to compromise their own findings, which uh, are very disappointing to Chinese scholars themselves. And they told me, we live here, but we have no way to handle that. We have to say those praising and positive uh, uh, findings, but you who are not under their pressure, under their prosecution, why you guys cannot say the truth? So how do you deal with it? Thank you. Great. Um, I'm really happy to have the chance to, to talk about uh, this this problem, um, which is particularly thorny because of the, um, the ethnographic uh, element of my work. I, uh, you know, what if the outcome is not in tune with the desires of um, the, the People's Republic of China's government? Well, that is guaranteed. No, no, scholars, no scholars' findings, if they proceed from the evidence, are going to line up with, with some outside entity's ideological um, uh, program. Uh, I, I don't compromise, or at least I, I, I think I don't. It's always hard to tell, um, at least in my, in my writing, uh, at least aside from hiding the identities of informants as best I can, because I am still, even as an outsider, subject to pressure from the Chinese state through the threat of the uh, arrest or firing of, of people that I interact with on the ground. And, that, and that, that's a lot, of, a, a, a lot, a lot to, to take on, and it's... It's a great it's a great challenge, and as I, I mentioned before, I I no longer uh, I, I went back to Xinjiang in December and I uh, made a conscious choice not to speak to any Uyghur contacts, only to speak to my Han Chinese contacts uh, there. Um, you know, uh, it's probably worth noting for everyone else here that um, something like thirteen scholars of of Islam in China were banned. Uh, uh, en masse in uh, a, a, about a decade uh, ago, and a few have been banned since then. This is this is not a concern for me. For one thing, I uh, at least at least right now, I like to think that I'm a little lower on their priority list. Um, but everyone gets every foreign researcher who deals with these topics gets attention from the state. I don't know a single person 
in my field who has not been invited to tea or detained or otherwise uh, questioned. It's something we're all familiar with and we all have different reactions to. Um, it is, I'm, I'm also glad that you pointed out that a lot of scholars do pull punches. Recently, two uh, scholars backed out of a special issue of China Quarterly because another scholar was going to put an article about Xinjiang in the same journal with them. So this is, this is an important uh, issue, and, uh, and, and I'm hoping maybe to hear more about it in the panel on uh, uh, censorship, academic freedom that's, that's later today. Thanks. Other questions? Please. Um, thank you. I have the, I think, the microphone. Uh, my name is Suzanne Blier, and I'm an African art historian working at the interstices of uh, that continent in Europe and the Islamic world on various things. And this is my second ACLS meeting. Um, probably my last, but last year, this section of the meeting was indeed transformative, and this year it is even more so. Not to say that everything else has not also been extraordinary, but when one comes from the academy, it, one doesn't always realize how important and powerful and provocative everyone is and uh, in terms of this larger um, set of concerns that, that people are dealing with here. Uh, and this year I want to commend particularly the, the three um, amazing, brilliant speakers, uh, in part because of the, the wide range, and, and those who selected them, of course, um, at cross-disciplinary work, which is, um, I think, particularly vital and particularly important at this point in time, and especially difficult to do, not only from the vantage point of languages um, and different kinds of methodologies within the disciplines, but also different geographic areas. And so I have a, a question for, for all three of you on the, quest, on the issue of translation. Um, and of course, one is always translating languages, period, uh, you know, context of language use. Uh, and um, when one is translating, if one is writing a book or anything, you, you have to find generally one word that will suffice. And obviously, in many contexts, it's never the one you really want. But you have to kind of make those decisions. And then there are other cases where the translation issues are so complex that having a discourse about the very nature of translation, translation comes into play. And I just wondered, as the three of you have worked on your projects, uh, is there one particular moment or context where you've just wanted to pull out your hair over uh, an issue of translation and, and how might that inform both your work and our understanding of what you're doing? Thank you. It's a, it's a wonderful question. Thank you for that question. Um, I think where I am dealing with this the most is actually um, in the context of the database project um, and where translation comes into play there is in the issue of interoperability with other resources that are already exist or are in development. So one thing that I've realized through the history of studying this lapsed database is that um, you need to be uh, in conversation with the other resources that exist and the research people are doing across fields and across periods and national traditions and international traditions in order to um, have enough of a user base for your resource to survive. And so one of the things we've been trying to do is to make sure that someone can take data from our um, set and put it into conversation or combine it with data on the French theater, um, on other periods. So we're working with the folks who are doing a 19th century London stage. We're working with people who made the Comédie Française Registers project. Um, and we're working with people who are working on American playbills at, at Penn. So um, for us, it's then how do we create some kind of engine that will translate the names and the concepts of our fields um, are fields in the database so that um, they can be combined with somebody else's and be able to do a larger comparative study. And so, um, you know, 
one illustration of the challenges of this is that uh, at one point, one of our collaborators in French history very optimistically said, well, as long as you've got a date, you know, that you can at least compare what happened in Paris that day and what happened in London that day. And I said, they weren't on the same calendar. <laughs> so those are the issues we're dealing with. Uh, great question. Uh, I think this is why the ACLS has been such a wonderful opportunity. I'm a trained historian, and as, but as you might note from my presentation, I've encountered poetry, <laughs> literature, <laughs> plays, and one of my colleagues, uh, Meta Jones, formerly of Howard University, has often encouraged me to slow down and actually, actually engage the grammatical structures and the phraseologies and the, from a different lens. And for me, usually as an historian, I, I want a date. I want a connection to an idea. This person met that person, and they said something connected to black internationalism. That's all I need. But wait a minute, right? Maybe you should read the poem. <laughs> read the poem. And, 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 and so that, that sense of translating the meaning within the print and the slow reading has been something that the ACLS has given the opportunity to really slow down and actually spend time and actually, you know, look at the photograph, look at the connection. For me, the photograph, who's in the photograph? OK, got you. That's it as opposed to the intentionality of how the photograph may be framed and the, the meaning behind, the positionality of all those, all those other, the, the vocabulary of other disciplines and, and the, from the soundscapes, um, much less the learning the, the localized creoles to, to move around in, in the various societies has been a, a wonderful experience and challenge that um, I think has made me a much better scholar in, in the process. So I, I embrace the, the challenge of, of enthusiasm, totally. Thanks. Ryan? Uh, tra translation is very much at the, the heart of the material that I'm, that I'm working on. A lot of the individuals who were producing texts in uh, uh, Muslims who were producing texts in, in China were operating in multiple languages at, at the same time. And often you see the multiple languages in the same, in the same text. And indeed, the very first uh, Islamic texts written in Chinese were translations. You might not recognize them as translations in the way we think of them uh, today, but they, they were viewed as translations at the time. They're extremely liberal translations. Um, and they dealt with some particular linguistic uh, uh, problems that are that are peculiar to the languages involved. So, in in English, when we use Islamic terms like, for example, Muslim, um, we we often or Quran, we take them we take them from from the Arabic. But in in Chinese, that was not done, partly because of the way that uh, the Chinese language the way that the Chinese language works, but also the way that scholarship and reading worked in uh, 17th and 18th century China and its connection to the bureaucratic imperial state. So you get things like translating Islam as uh, qing, qingzhen, that, um, which means uh, pure and true, um, uh, and, and calling a Muslim a hui hui instead of a Muslim or something, something like that. Uh, a lot of these texts that were translated then took up Confucian and Taoist and Buddhist terminology to get their ideas across to people who had no, no concept of a prophet. So Muhammad becomes the ultimate sage instead of, uh, instead of a prophet. And a lot of scholars have taken this as a kind of uh, syncretism, but I prefer to see it more as, uh, more as translation. Because when you look at the Persian and the Arabic sources that scholars were using alongside of these Chinese texts, we see them translating them back from the Chinese into the Persian and Arabic. And the old uh, familiar Perso-Arabic terminology um, reappears when, when that happens. So um, I, uh, I, I'm still not sure how far I'm, I'm going to go with the, the translation element of this, but it, it's, it certainly is important and suggests some, uh, some rather unusual highlighting of the issues of translation in, in this material. I'm, uh, my question uh, goes to Professor Burkhardt, and I'm a musicologist. And 
We are all wrestling with how precisely the great music of the past was financed, something that many people who love uh, classical music don't want to think about, uh, the material conditions. And you know, I would point out that the Royal Academy, at the time you were uh, speaking, and many of those barbs that Richard Steele was throwing out were aimed at George Frederick Handel, yeah. whom we all love. Um, and uh, so we are, you know, constantly in musicology trying to figure out how still to honor uh, the products of these very messy situations while uh, paying attention to them. You know, this doesn't go away when you have the Koch brothers uh, as principal donors to the Metropolitan Opera. Um, how do we disentangle uh, or should we re-entangle the relationship between uh, the, the music that many humanists uh, devote their lives to with the history, uh, the very complicated history of uh, the financing of, of that music? And I wonder if you would just speak a little bit more to that and thank you for your work. Thank you, that's a, that's a great question and I didn't mention Handel, but yes, the context for much of this was um, Handel coming to, to London and, um, and I, I love Handel's music, so <laughs> I'm not team steel. Um, I, I think we need to re-entangle them. I think the, that much of the scholarship on the, the music and the theater of the time um, doesn't want to think as much about the material conditions uh, of the production as the people of the time did. And for me, in looking at the um, periodicals, many, many, many periodicals surrounding the financing of the opera in the first decades of the 18th century, uh, readers of all classes and those who did and did not have access to the theater and to the opera were absolutely fascinated with the consequences of the material conditions around it. And you have notices in, you know, a paper like the Diverting Post in the, around 1705 when there was sort of a failed attempt to get an opera going at the Haymarket um, about, well, it's gonna to cost too much to hire a carriage to go to where they're trying to put that opera house, right? So, so who can afford a carriage to that opera house, right? Um, so people at the time were deeply concerned with the, these conditions and, uh, and I'm very interested in, in rediscovering those concerns and what was at stake in them because what was at stake in them was not only uh, the music and the theater itself but these much broader issues about, about class shift and about the development of speculative finance. And um, the, just to say that the shares in the theater and in the opera were broken up into million little derivatives and sold off in pieces. And so ordinary people could get themselves, you know, one one hundredth of a share in, in some portion of this company and, and did so. And so they were very interested in the finance of these institutions. Well, I fear that I, it's time for me to thank the panelists for terrific presentations and all of you.